Well, the last time we were together in this series of eschatology, I was talking about the Battle of Armageddon. And <clears throat> if you remember, the Battle of Armageddon ends with the Lord Jesus coming back with ten thousands of his saints. Well, then what happens? What happens after that? Well, we enter a period known as the millennial reign. Well, what in the world does that mean? What does millennial mean? Millennial means a thousand. In Second Peter 3.8, Peter says this, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, has God given us some ambiguous figure saying that time doesn't mean anything to him? No, he's being very specific. He's saying one day is the same as a thousand years, and a thousand years is the same as one day in his sight. Remember he told Isaiah, he says, my ways are above your ways, my thoughts are above your thoughts. God thinks differently. He sees things differently, and he's telling us about time. Now, why is that important? Well, how long did it take God to create the universe? Six. And on the seventh day, he created something called rest. On the seventh day, he rested. Why? Because he was tired? No. He created this thing called rest. Because he wants us to work six days and rest one day. Have a Sabbath day. Well, <clears throat> if you think of six days or seven days that one week period as 7,000 years instead of seven days, it's been 2,000 years from Adam to Moses, 2,000 years from Moses to Jesus, 2,000 years from Jesus to today. That's 6,000 years. And then after that, there's a one-day period known as the millennial reign, another 1,000-year period, so 7,000 years or seven days to God. So he created the whole universe in six days rested on the seventh, and he let man work out his whole history in 6,000 years and rested on the seventh thousandth year period. Well, what happens at the end of a week? A new week starts, right? That's why eight and the number of theomatics, eight is the number of new beginnings. So after that one week, a new week starts. Well, after this millennial reign, then a whole new program that God's got in mind starts to happen. In Revelation chapter 20, I'm going to start at verse 2 and I'm going through verse 7. He tells us, this is how we know it's going to be a thousand years. It says, he laid hold on that dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. In case you're wondering who he's referring to, that's just about every name you can have for him except maybe Lucifer and Beelzebub. He says he grabbed this guy and he bound him for how long? A thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. There's that thousand years again. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. It says he must be loosed. There's a purpose. There's a reason that he's going to be loosed. It's not that the devil, after a thousand years, figures out a way to escape. Or the devil picks the lock and gets a bunch of other demons to help him and they break free. No, it's part of God's plan. God knows that's going to happen even before it happened. It's part of the plan. It must happen that he's going to be loosed for a little season. Well, why in the world would God do that? I'll tell you in a little bit. And he says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death have no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Now, a lot of things i got to just cover here briefly. 
in that thousand year period there's going to be different groups of people that are going to live in the millennial reign there's going to be us who came back with him and what are we going to be doing what are we going to be like i'll tell you in a moment but the other people are going to be people who lived and made it through the tribulation period the other ones are the ones who died and were beheaded for their faith during the tribulation and they're resurrected that's the first resurrection the other ones who died during the tribulation period that were not christians won't be resurrected during the millennial reign that's coming later and he said blessed are those who are part of the first resurrection because the second death has no power over them well what's the second death every single human being is born at least once anybody here never been born if you've never been born you're not even you don't even have a piece in the game everybody has to be born once and guess what it's appointed unto man once to die then the judgment everyone is physically born and everyone is physically going to die now what's the second death remember Jesus said you must be born again or else you can't even see the kingdom of heaven there's a spiritual birth and a spiritual death everybody is physically born once and physically dies once but spiritually you're either going to be born again or you're going to die a second time I've been born again so I'm never going to die spiritually the second death now if Jesus doesn't come back I am going to die physically I've been born once and I'm going to die once but spiritually because I chose to be born again I don't have to die spiritually a second time but those that have not been born again will die spiritually a second time that's called the second death and John is saying here blessed are those who um, the second death has no power over them so how does this millennial reign how does it actually happen how is it going to take place well, in Jude chapter 1, verse 14, remember at the end of the battle of Armageddon, Jesus comes back, and it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. That's how the millennial reign begins. When the battle of Armageddon ends, the millennial reign begins. Now, <clears throat> we talked about before how in the rapture Jesus comes and we meet him in the air there's three heavens remember what Paul said he said he ascended into the third heaven and saw things that's not lawful for man to repeat the first heaven is the earth's atmosphere the ionosphere stratosphere all those the second heaven is the physical universe where the celestial bodies revolve the third heaven is where God lives outside the physical universe because Isaiah says God says yep the universe is about that wide the span of his hand God lives outside the physical universe in the third heaven but when Jesus comes back the first time he's in the earth's atmosphere and we meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with him but now when he comes back with ten thousands of his saints he's going to land his feet on the Mount of Olives in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11 remember when Jesus ascended and all the disciples are there and they watch him just rise up from the Mount of Olives get caught up in a cloud and he's gone and on either side are angels and they say this ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same Jesus not a different Jesus not a new and enlightened aeon Christ off his spirit no this same Jesus there's only one Christ and his name is Jesus this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven you saw his feet leave the Mount of Olives he's coming back and his feet are going to land on the Mount of Olives only this time he's coming with all of his raptured Saints ten thousands of his Saints well then what happens in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 3 through 5 the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord make straight in the desert a highway for our God every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight 
and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. If you go on Google Maps and you type in Mount of Olives, Israel, you'll see an aerial view of the Mount of Olives. And if you scan over a little bit, you'll see the city of Jerusalem. Well, in between the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives is this long, deep valley. Well, Isaiah just told us when Jesus' feet lands on the Mount of Olives, and we're all behind him in our glorified bodies, the valleys are going to be lifted up and the mountains are going to come down. Jesus is going to walk on straight ground, right straight towards the city of Jerusalem. And what's he going to do then? The earth's geography is going to change as soon as his feet land on the Mount of Olives. What's going to happen then? In Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 through 2. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Jesus is going to walk from the Mount of Olives across the risen valley right into the walls of Jerusalem, and he's going to go through the eastern gate. Now, why the eastern gate? What's that mean? Well, the eastern gate of Jerusalem, which also the scripture refers to as the golden gate or the beautiful gate, that is the gate that two things gives you the most direct access to the Temple Mount, but it's also the gate that Jesus entered into Jerusalem during his triumphal entry. Remember when that triumphal entry, everybody was saying, oh, Hosanna, oh, praise God, oh, save us. You know, the king of Israel, and they're all excited, and he goes into the temple, and he whips the money changers out of there, and they say, oh, wow, he's going to take over control now. And Jesus said, no, my kingdom is not of this world. And he kind of let him down. As a matter of fact, he got crucified a week later. And they're thinking, this isn't the way we had it planned. And God says, it's going to happen just at a different time. When Jesus comes back, he's going through that eastern gate. And he's going to set up his kingdom just like they thought he was going to. Just brief history. The eastern gate has been sealed shut ever since A.D. 1540. And it was done by the order of a sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And the reason that this sultan shut that gate was he thought by closing the eastern gate... It would prevent the Jewish Messiah from gaining entrance into Jerusalem. Even the Muslims know that. And the eastern gate has remained sealed for over 500 years. In I think it was in the, in the 80s, like 1989, something like that, the mayor of Jerusalem thought, wouldn't it be cool, we'll open up the eastern gate and we'll put like a food bar in there and we can bring visitors in from around the world and no matter how hard they tried, that gate could not get open. Because you know what? That gate's never going to be open until Jesus comes and puts his hand on that gate and man, that thing's going to swing wide open. If I could ever go to Jerusalem before Jesus returns, one thing I want to do is I want to go there and put my hands on that eastern gate. Because the next time I go through that gate, it's going to be with Jesus, and I'm going to have a glorified body. So his feet are going to land on the Mount of Olives. He goes into the eastern gate, and he sets up his kingdom. In Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 3, it says this, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Jesus said, I told you I'm the king of Israel. On Wednesday night Bible study, we were talking about how they hung over the cross. Here's the king of the Jews. In three different languages. The three languages that were spoken at that time. Guess what? He is the king of the Jews. He is going to be the king of Israel. He is going to enter into the city. He is going to enter into the third temple. And when Jesus, during his triumphal entry, he remember he threw the money changers out and cleansed the temple. And he said, this, is, this temple is supposed to be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. Well, the last thing that took place in the third temple before Jesus got there, remember we talked about a couple weeks ago, 
the Antichrist goes in there at the end of the tribulation period and he sits down and says, I'm not just a good guy, I'm God, worship me. And Daniel calls that the abomination of desolation in the holy place. Well, Jesus is going to go and sweep that spirit out of there and he's going to sit down there and say, I am the king of Israel. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Have you ever been to the ocean or been to a sea? The water covers the ocean pretty good, doesn't it? Well, the knowledge, the wisdom, the rule, the reign, the control, the power of all the earth and the glory of God is going to cover all the earth just like the waters cover the sea. It's not going to be a democratic rule. It's not going to be a Republican rule, a conservative, a liberal, a, a communist, a fascist. It's not going to be a, a dictatorship. It's going to be a theocracy, just like God wanted it to be with Israel all that time until they demanded a king like everybody else had. And Jesus is going to rule and reign the world. And it, the, his wisdom, his knowledge, his glory is going to go earth, cover the whole earth. Well, once he sets up his kingdom, the first thing that's going to happen, he told us in Matthew twenty four thirty one, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, this isn't talking about the rapture. He's going to gather his people, Israel, and bring them to Jerusalem. And once they all get to Jerusalem, what's going to happen then? Zechariah 12, verses 10 through 11. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in the bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of hadad Raman in the valley of Megiddon. So what's going to happen is Israel, the ones that are still alive on the planet earth after the tribulation and those that became Christians, they're all going to be brought to Jerusalem and they're going to see Jesus sitting on the throne of David in the middle of Zion, and they're going to look upon him whom they've pierced and they're going to weep bitterly and they're going to repent and say, Oh, Lord, we're so sorry. When all those Christians were telling us you were the Messiah, we didn't believe you. We fell for that false Messiah, that substitute Christ, Antichrist. We fell for him for seven years. And then it was revealed he was just nothing more than a devil in disguise. And you are the true king of Israel. And they're going to repent and then the whole world, as we know it, is going to change. In Psalm 72, verses 7 through 11, In his days the righteous will flourish. Prosperity will abound till moon is no more. He will rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The desert tribes will bow before him and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present him gifts. All kings will bow down to him, and all nations will serve him. Those that are still alive, that made it through the tribulation period, are all going to come to Jerusalem, because the word, I mean, they're going to see the world change. The geography of the world is going to change. And a few more changes I'll read to you in a moment. And they're going to say, something's going on. And Jesus is back. And they're going to go see him. And every king, every leader, every ruler is going to bow down and say, no, no, no. You are the king of all kings. You are the Lord of all lords. And all the world is going to flourish and be prosperous because Jesus is in control. In Micah chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. 
and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their shears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. For a thousand years, every handgun, people want to get rid of guns and gun control. You know what? They're going to melt them down and turn them into pruning hooks and plows because everybody's going to be given their plot of property and they're going to grow, you know, rutabagas and turnips and whatever you want. And I'm going to have so many rutabagas, I'll go over to your house and say, here, I'll trade you for a bushel of wheat. And it's going to be so magnificent it's going to be flourishing the way it should be and nobody's i'm not going to want to fight you anymore there's going to be no more war and people are going to say let us go to the house of god you know the muslims have to go to mecca at least once in their life and do a jihad (coughs) in america if you're a white anglo-saxon america American, you have to go to Disney World at least once in your life. It's just an unspoken law, right? But then everybody's going to say, we got to go to Jerusalem and see Jesus. And Jesus is going to be sitting on the throne, and he's going to teach. It says he's going to teach all the world, teach his ways from the mountain of the Lord. Now, here's some other changes that take place in the world. Isaiah 65 18 through 25. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will joy in Jerusalem. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed, and they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. (coughs) For as the days of the... Of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy. And all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. There's going to be no more crying, no more weeping. Everybody's going to be happy. You're going to grow things, and you're not going to have to put a lock on your door and worry about somebody in and stealing what you put in your, grew in your vineyard or breaking into your house. Because, and I'll tell you why that's going to take place, but there's going to be no more danger no more harm no more evil for a thousand years and it said infants are not going to die young the only way you can have an infant is if people are born during the millennial reign and old men aren't going to die after a certain amount of time remember what god told adam he says hey adam come on i want to tell you something see that tree over there you can have anything you want in the whole garden here but don't eat of that tree because the day you eat of that tree you're going to die Well, guess what happened? Adam ate of that. Did he die that day? No. So was God a liar? God forbid. But what did Peter tell us? A day with the Lord is the same as a thousand years. A thousand years is the same as a day. How old was Adam when he died? He was like 929 years old. Who's the oldest person who ever lived in history? Methuselah. 969 years. And the last time I checked, 969 is younger than 1,000. So nobody has ever lived one day in God's sight. But during the millennial reign, everybody lives one day. So the other thing that takes place 
is lions are going to eat straw like bullocks. Why is that? Isaiah chapter 11, 6 through 10. The wolf also shall dwell with a lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with a kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. The young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to which shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. When Jesus lands his feet on the Mount of Olives, the geography of the earth is going to change. The politics are going to change. It's now a theocracy. The agriculture is going to change. Everybody's going to be able to grow and flourish. But not only that, the animal kingdom is going to change. Remember in the 8th chapter of Romans, Paul says, All of creation groaneth for the day of his return. When you watch National Geographic and you see that lion hiding in the weeds and jump on that gazelle and rip him apart and eat him, that lion saying, I don't want to do this, but I got to. Because the sin nature has affected even the animal kingdom. But in the millennial reign, little kids are going to go ride on lions just like they would on a donkey. And little kids are going to be able to play with a poisonous snake and they won't get bit. There's no more poison. The animal kingdom is going to change. It's going to be wonderful. So, what are we going to be doing? The people that died during the tribulation, that were not Christians, that did not go along with God's plan, that did take the mark of the beast, they're all dead. They're in the center of the earth. The people who made it through but didn't die, and those who were beheaded and died as Christians, come back, and they're the ones living on the earth. Remember when um, John and James, their mommy, went over to Jesus and said, Hey, Lord, please, these are my, my baby boys. And, you know, they gave up the fishing business. And So when you come into your kingdom, can they sit on either side of your throne? And Jesus looked at him and he says, You don't even know what you're asking. Are they able to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? And he says, You know what? They will. Well, during the millennial reign, Jesus is going to be sitting in the holy temple, in the holy place of the new third temple. And all the disciples are going to be on either side of them. Their mommy's going to get their wish. James and John are going to be sitting on either side. Well, where are we going to be? We came back with them with glorified bodies. Remember when Jesus came to to the guys hiding in the upper room after the crucifixion? They're all locked up in the upper room. The door's locked and they're shaking in their boots. You know, our master got killed. If they could kill him, what are they going to do to us? There's rumors that the Roman soldiers are looking for us and we're going to be the next ones to be crucified. And they're scared to death. Well, there's not a knock on the door. Nobody unlocks the door. Just all of a sudden, Jesus appears. And they go, what? Is this a ghost? And he says, no, come here, touch me. Remember what he said to Thomas? Touch me, handle me. He was tangible. But then after he got done talking to him, they looked and he disappeared again. He didn't go over to the door and say, would you guys open the door so I can leave? No, he just disappeared. Now John, one of the guys that was there in First John said, I don't know what we're going to be like, but I know we're going to be like him. Jesus, any time he wanted to, could appear and disappear and go places at the speed of thought. He could be on the road to Emmaus. They break bread, he's gone. He's over in the, uh, the upper room. He's gone. Now he's on the beach cooking fish for the guys that are out on the boats. Then he's gone. That's what we're going to be like. So in the millennial reign, not everybody is going to be born again. Not everyone's going to be saved. There's going to be people being born. There's going to be some that were resurrected who died as Christians for their faith. But there's going to be a lot of people that aren't even saved. And there may be some guy in Ethiopia that wants to go steal from somebody else's vineyard. 
And Jesus is going to say, Jake, go over there. And Jake, at the speed of thought, is going to say, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, we don't do that in Jesus' kingdom anymore. No stealing allowed. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. And then there's going to be a guy over here in Cleveland that wants to cheat on his wife. And Jesus is going to say, Gary, go. And Gary's going to go over there, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, we don't do that in Jesus' kingdom, remember? Oh, I'm sorry. And then he goes back to his wife. We're going to be the spiritual policemen. Now, how do you know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3. Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? You know why fallen angels hate us so much? One, because we're created in the image of God. Two, because God loves us so much. And three, because they know someday we're going to judge them. And they hate us. Hate us beyond description. But before we judge them, we're going to be the spiritual police on the planet Earth. Because we're going to come back with glorified bodies, riding that white horse. Can't wait to get that hair out of my eyes when it's flapping in the wind. So I'm riding my white horse. And then, just like, remember what Jesus said, if anybody hurts one of these little ones, their angels behold the face of God daily. What angels do is every day they go to the throne room Remember the beginning of the book of Job when all the sons of God came to present themselves to God? The angels go to the throne room and see the commander-in-chief and say, what do you want us to do? And he gives them their command for the day. And they go out and they either fight in the heavenlies or they come down here and they're ministering spirits to help us. They do what they're supposed to do. During the millennial reign, we're going to go to Jerusalem and see Jesus sitting on the throne. The commander-in-chief say, Lord, what do you want us to do? Uh, Dave, I need you to go to uh, Philadelphia because there's somebody there that's thinking about um, breaking into somebody's house. And I go over there, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, not in Jesus' kingdom. We don't do that anymore. And that's what we're going to be doing for a thousand years. It's going to be paradise. There's going to be no evil. It's going to be almost like the Garden of Eden. It's going to be wonderful. I can't wait. And we'll be able to see Jesus any time and ask him questions. And he'll answer all of our questions. And people are going to come from all over the world to sit at the feet of Jesus and be taught by him. But what's going to spoil it? What's going to change it? Why won't it last forever? Remember Revelation 20, verse 3? And they cast that devil, the old serpent, in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be fulfilled. After a thousand years, what's going to happen? And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So the devil, the same angel that chained him in that pit is going to come out and say, okay, Bucky boy, your time's go. You, you can go, get out of here. And he's going to fly out like a bat out of hell. Forgive the term, but that's where that term comes from. And then what's he going to do? Revelation 20, verses 8 through 9. And he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, some people say, see, that's when the battle of Armageddon comes. Because it says right here, he's gathering Gog and Magog. That can't be the battle of Armageddon. Because the way the battle of Armageddon ends, Jesus comes back with ten thousands of his saints. Well, Jesus can't come back with ten thousands of his saints because he's already here. He's he's in the holy city and the ten thousands of his saints is us. We're here on the earth. So what he's going to do is when he gets out of there, he's been plotting and planning and scheming for a thousand years. When he comes out, he's going back to that old honey hole, good old Gog and Magog. Come on, guys, let's get stirred up. And you say, why in the world would anybody, after being with Jesus for a thousand years and living in this paradise, why would they ever decide to go with the devil? Well, think about it. Not everybody in the millennial reign is born again. Not everybody is a Christian, is a follower of Jesus, has the Spirit of God living in them. What if you wanted a cigarette for a thousand years? What if you wanted a drink for a thousand years? And the devil comes along and says, guess what? 
Yeah, it's pretty cool around here. But Jesus, aren't you tired of having him and these these saints flying around telling you what you can and can't do? You get one more chance to do whatever you want. Come on, follow me. And they're going to go for it. They're going to go for it. But it's not going to last. It's only for a little season. And God's going to say, that's the end of the story. So I just read to you Revelation 20, verses 8 and 9. Listen to what Revelation 9, I'm sorry, 20, verse 10 says. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now see, that's why it can't be the battle of Armageddon. Because at the battle of Armageddon, he's cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. This temptation, he's thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are already are. At the battle of Armageddon, the, the Antichrist and the false prophet are right there in the middle of the battle. Now they're already in the lake of fire. The devil gets thrown in there and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go in this, but just a side note. There's a lot of teaching out there that's called annihilationism. Some believe that, you know, once you're thrown in the lake of fire, then you don't exist anymore. Do you remember what you were doing before you were born? Of course not. Well, you won't remember what happens to you after you die. But this says they're tormented day and night forever and ever. There's no such thing as annihilationism. I wish that wasn't true. But when God creates an eternal soul, it stays eternal. And we get to choose where we want to spend our eternity, with him or away from him. The other teaching that's out there is don't worry, it's called universalism. Eventually everybody gets saved. You know, because Jesus will throw you in the lake of fire if you've been a bad boy. And after you're down there burning for a little while, you say, you know what, I've been thinking about it. I think I'll get saved. And then you say, okay, Jesus, I'm sorry, please forgive me now. Then he takes you out of hell, and then you're born again, and you get to skip off into eternity. Well, if that was true, there's two ways to get to heaven. You can just get born again and give your life to Jesus. Or you can live like the devil. And as soon, You know what I would do if that was the case? I just go do whatever I want. And as soon as I die, as soon as my toenails touch that flame, okay, I changed my mind now. I want to be a Christian. I, I'm changed my mind. There's no universalism. God gives everybody a chance in this earth. And people say, well, that's not fair. They get, why not a second chance? He gives the whole earth a thousand years. And there's still going to be people, after seeing Jesus face to face, are going to still decide to go with the devil. So, why is God even allowing this? This little, you know, little season thing. That doesn't seem fair. Well, it's nothing but fair. Because God never goes against anybody's free will, and everybody gets a choice, gets an opportunity. You know, in the Masonic Lodge, they call, the crea- they call their leader the great architect of the universe. You know what an architect does? An architect takes things that already exist and builds something out of it. That's the devil. Once you're in the 30th degrees and above in the Masonic Lodge, you realize that you're getting your seething power from Lucifer, the great architect of the universe. But God is not an architect. He's a creator. He builds things out of nothing. The devil can't create anything. He can only rearrange and change things that God's already put into existence. Now, God is the most massive, awesome, colossal, mind-blowing. There's not enough adjectives to describe what a genius God is and what an incredible builder he is. Let me ask you a question. You're going to build a beautiful skyscraper. Are you going to lay down some you know, wood and straw and hay and stubble and then spend billions of dollars on all the, the, the beautiful ornate work of the skyscraper made out of steel and cement and you know stained glass and all that because as soon as you're done with your skyscraper and there there's a hiccup the thing's going to come crashing because the foundation is no good well god has a plan after that seven weeks or that seven thousand years is over god's got a plan but any good builder is going to test his foundation first and all of this All this whole seven weeks, 
You know, people say, oh, well, the devil, you know, ruined God's plan. No, God never went against Lucifer's free will, and he used him as an aggregate to get his will done. He's testing all of us. That's why Paul says, the trying of your faith is more precious than that of even gold. In 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, Paul says this. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. God is building something. He's got a plan for all eternity. We're going to talk more about that next week. He's got a plan, but he's got to first test the foundation. He tried all the angels to see who would stand true to him, and one-third decided to fall. Two-thirds stayed true to God. But he tests every single human being. You notice how it's said in there, he knows those that are his? How does he know that? Think about it. I'm just one person living on the planet Earth in the year 2000, what is it, 18? Believe it or not. With 7 billion people. I live in a body that wants to sin every day. That's all it wants to do. It wants to lay in bed all day. It doesn't want to work. It wants to eat ding-dongs and ho-hos and just sit there and flip through the channels. It wants to just live in a lap of luxury and whatever whim just fulfill those desires. That's all this body wants to do. But inside, the personality, the soul is me, my personality. Now, my spirit's saying, follow Jesus. My body says, I just go like everybody else. Go the route of least resistance. And I live in a world that's a sinful world. That's why the animals eat each other. That's why there's evil in the world, because of the sin nature. And I live in a world with seven billion other sinners. And I live in a world that has fallen angels around here trying to interrupt and trying to tempt people and lure us away from Jesus and in the midst of all that just little old me David the personality in the midst of all this I look up and I say Jesus I love you and I want to serve you I want to be obedient to you I'm not always perfect I don't always do the right thing I don't always say the right thing I don't always have all the right answers but in my heart you cut me open I believe Jesus I want to serve you God looks down to that and says you know I know who's mine. Because if he'll serve me in the midst of all that, when I give him a glorified body and he sees me face to face, I know I can trust him. That's a part of a foundation I can trust. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for perfection. Man looks on the outward. God's looking on the heart. Where is your heart? In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. And they are built up the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God is building something. He's got a plan. We don't know what it is yet. He's got a plan. And you know what he's using as building materials? He calls us lively stones. Just think of a pile of bricks over there. If those bricks all had personalities and could talk. Some of them say, no, I'm not going part of that building. I'm going to go do something else. And some of the bricks says, okay, you're the master builder. Whatever you want me to do. If you want me to be on the bottom or the top or in the middle, I'll do anything you want me to do. Which brick are you going to use? That's what he's looking for. That's why he's going to let Satan be loosed for a little season. That's why he's let the devil run amok for 6,000 years. That's why he hasn't killed all the fallen angels. Because every part of his creation, all the angels and all of us human beings, we can do whatever we want. He will not go against our free will. He wants us to go towards him. He wants us to go his way. So 
Next week, I'm going to talk about what happens after this, after the millennial reign. And there's three judgments. I'm going to talk about those. But what do we do in the meantime? You know what? I'm 64 years old, and I've been around the block once or twice, and I've learned a few things. Doing things my way is always easier, and it always feels good at the moment. But the benefits that I reap from it don't work so good. Doing things God's way usually seems harder. It's not as pleasant, but the benefits of that last forever. We all have our own choice. You can do things God's way or your way. Now, I'm just like you. I want to do things my way. But God's way works, and the benefits are eternal. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter, you know, if you've been a great person, a bad person, a good Christian, a mediocre. It doesn't matter. The past is the past. The past does not equal the future. From this moment on, you can be anything you want. And you notice how Paul said, those that purge themselves. Just be honest and say, God, I'm not doing so well. I want to do better. I want to line up with you. I want to be on your side. And all you got to do is have that desire and work in that direction. You don't have to be perfect because if perfection was the, the requirement, sorry, I'm, I'm out of hope. I have no hope. I've never been perfect, never will be, not in this life. But the heart, the desire, that's what God's looking for. So come back next week. We'll talk about the three different judgments that are going to take place. And then after that, we're going to talk about something called the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. And just we get a, just a glimmer of what God's plan is that's going to last forever and forever and forever. Though I've been 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, of no less days to sing God's praise than when I first begun. Amen.